morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Welcome to BRBC. If you could stand with us now, we're going to sing some praise to God. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, He can move the mind my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Morning, everybody. Please take your seats. I want to say that to all of you who feel weary and you want rest, to all who feel guilty and need a savior, to all who, all who feel doubt, and what assurance and peace. Well, this church opens wide its arms with a welcome of Jesus Christ to every single one of you this morning. Jesus, he is the one who gives rest to the weary. He's the one who provides forgiveness for the guilty. And he is the Prince of Peace for those who need peace. So a massive welcome to every single one of you. Now I wonder what kind of January you have had. It feels like it's been a long January, hasn't it? I don't know if it's just me. Long, dreary, dark, dank, cold. I wonder how you walked into church this morning or even the last week that you've had. Maybe it's been a great month or a great week and you feel on top of the world or maybe it's felt monotonous or slow or maybe it's felt really sad. I wonder, how did you come into church this morning? Well, however you came, I want you to know that there is a saviour who can provide you with the rest and satisfaction that every human heart is craving. 
and he can do that today. So welcome to you. Now let me introduce who I am and who we are. My name's James, I'm lead pastor here, and we are Bradford and Ruffin Baptist Church. People call us BRBC. And our big mission statement in church life is loving Jesus together and helping others to do the same. That is what we do as a church family. Now, how's uh, the service going to pan out this morning? Well, in a moment or two, we're going to have something called the all-in slot. After that, we're going to sing some songs together. Then we have a mid-service break, and the kids go out into their groups. And then across the church, in here and in all of the kids' groups, there is age-specific teaching. And us grown-ups, we're going to be continuing on with our series in First Peter. But make sure you stick around for a coffee and a donut afterwards. That's such an important part to connect and catch up with others in our church family. Now, before we continue on in our service, I've got some need to knows for you guys this morning. So the first one is for tonight. This evening, we have something called Love Your Neighbor. Love Your Neighbor is, is, is us kind of saying, right, we're not going to have anything going on at church this Sunday night. Because life is crazy, life is demanding, family life is hectic, church can be busy too. So it's carving out space in our diary to connect with others. So there'll be nothing here tonight, but we encourage the whole BRBC family to connect with people in your community. So if there's somebody on on the street that you live in, one of your neighbours who you could be building bridges with and building some community in those relationships... Love Your Neighbour is all about that. So think about, maybe you've got it, already got it mapped out, but if you haven't already, maybe there's a neighbour you could be having around this afternoon for cake and coffee. Maybe there's a neighbour you could be sharing your dinner with tonight. Love Your Neighbour. We are passionate about you guys, us together, building connections with our community. Okay, next one comes up this, well, actually it was going to be this week, Hope Explored. Now, you would have seen these postcards by the doors when you came in. We've been on about it for weeks. Now, to make it more accessible, we realized there was a lot of people signing up who were saying, I can come to the other two, but I can't come to the first one. So what we're going to do is start Hope Explored, not on the 30th of January, but it's going to start on the 6th of February. So not this Tuesday. But the next following Tuesday, Hope Explored. It is a basic introduction to what it means to be a Christian and to know the hope that comes through Jesus. So there are still one or two spaces left. I think we can squeeze people in. So if you do not yet consider yourself a Christian or you know somebody who would be interested in Hope Explored, there is still now time to therefore grab those last two spaces and invite them along, or you can sign up too. You can do that through the link in the email or on our website. More details there. Okay, two more for us. BRBC Weekend Away, we have loved how many people have signed up this week. It looks like it's going to be really, really fun. So there are still spaces, of course. We've tried to make as much space as possible. There's loads of spaces on the campsite and a few more in the main house at Sizewell. So this is BRBC's first church weekend away. Sign up is open. We want you to be there. Now, if this is going to be financially difficult, don't be afraid or ashamed to let us know. We don't want that to be a burden or a barrier to you guys being there and us all being together as a church family. So jump onto our website, go onto the church calendar, and you can sign up. And you have any questions, please let us know. We're up for a really good weekend and pray for good weather too. Okay, finally... Ladies of BRBC, don't forget, the sign-ups are now open for the new uh, Women's Bible Conference, Hope Renewed. That's coming up at the end of April. Really encouraged again by the amount of sign-ups we've seen this week. It is now open to women from other churches and outside of the BRBC family as well. They can come too. But if you've not booked your space, jump onto that website, click the Hope Renewed link, and sign up right there. It looks like it is going to be a fantastic time for the women of our church family. All right, that's everything I have for the need to knows, but now we move into something called the all-in slot. This is when we learn something as a church family. It might be a Bible memory verse. It might be something about one of our mission partners, or like last week, it's something about church life. Well, we're going to stay with that theme of church life, and I want to highlight to you a wonderful group that we have going on in our church that not many people know about. Let's have that slide up. It is the Fellowship Lunch. It's coming. I know it's... It's coming. I know it's there. 
There it is. Well, okay, we'll go back a bit. Here we go. Fellowship Lunch. Now, the Fellowship Lunch is a group that meets at BRBC once a month. Uh, it's where they eat lunch together, where we sing songs, and we hear a message from the Bible. Now, the Fellowship Lunch is open to everyone, but the people who come along to this are usually those who are retired, even some elderly people who live on their own, and it's a great space to find community and to hear about Jesus. So every month, we have loads of people coming along. Now, at the Christmas one in December, we took some photos to give you guys a little taster of what happens here. So these are the ladies who help out. In particular, the three ladies on the left, Barbara, Liz, and Anita, they get here early on a Thursday, and they start cooking. And I'm talking like 8.30, 9 o'clock. They're in the kitchen, ready for lunch. And then... We hand all of the food out to everybody who's there. There's Alan handing out some of the food. Now, I'm really sorry if you've not had any breakfast and you're feeling hungry. I'm about to show you what's on that plate. That was the Christmas roast dinner. I'm telling you, people get some good food when they come along to this. And then we sit together. You'll recognize this room is the Sunday, where the Sunday school meets on a Sunday morning. Everybody gets together and they eat. And then we push the tables back to the side where we sing some songs and there is a message as well. I think this is a very special ministry and serves a lot of wonderful, wonderful people. But what I want to do is to get Alan and Barbara up, if that's okay, just to do a little bit of an interview about them because they've led this ministry. Come on, you two. They've led this ministry for many, many years, and we want to find out a bit about this ministry and how we can pray for them. Yes. So, could you tell us a little bit about Fellowship Lunch, please, you two? Yeah, the lunch Use that microphone, Alan. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> the lunches are held on the fourth Thursday of each month, um, from September through to June. We shop on the, sat on the Wednesday uh, beforehand, and on the Thursday morning, two or three ladies arrive to prepare the meals for about 30 people each month. The meals start at one o'clock with a cooked main course, followed by a sweet, and then cheese and biscuits, followed with a cup of tea or coffee. Um, we had one this last Thursday. Perhaps he's just going to uh, um, explain what we had on Thursday this last week. Um, on Thursday, we had chicken with a sweet and sour sauce, with baked potatoes, carrots, sprouts, and sweet corn. And then we had an apple tart and custard to follow. Mm, love it. Very tasty. <laughs> Following the meal, um, we move the tables and chairs around into a semicircle. And then, as James said, we have a few notices, um, some hymns, some favourites, uh, and then a time of prayer, uh, and then a short message. And we finish around about three o'clock um, in the afternoon. Great. Cool. What are you, some of your favourite things about this group that you lead? Do you want to do that one? Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of things I really enjoy about it, but I think some of the special things are that it's working with three lovely ladies in the kitchen who always come on really good time and they always turn up and they always give their very best as they serve the Lord in this way. I like chatting to the people too who come along. It's so often the time when you can really get close to people and just have a lovely chat with them. And I do enjoy seeing them, enjoy their meals and having a lovely time of fellowship one with another. Mm. Great. And how can we be praying for fellowship lunch for you and for those who serve? I think God knows um, that this world needs forgiveness uh, and that's why he sent us a saviour. And we want him to be known um, to these dear folk who come week by week. We want them to know who Jesus is and why he came. And we want them to know the Lord Jesus Christ as we know him too. And that would be my request for a prayer. Yeah. Do you want to comment? This is more sort of on a practical side, really. But that's that people might pray that we might be kept safe in the kitchen. There's lots of things going on there. And, um, and also for people who travel around to to get here. Often people to go to pick people up and ask that they might have safe travels. And for opportunities to, as we talk to people around the table, that they might be ready to listen and hear what the Lord has to say to them. And, and the Lord will bless the message that, from God's word that our speaker brings each month. 
Great. Great. And um, can others come along too, if there's anybody who wants to come? <laughs> well, we couldn't get you all in, I'm going to show you <laughs> that. But um, anyone can come, although, as, as James mentioned earlier, it's mainly for older folk. Um, we want to reach out into the villages around to um, get the local people in to hear the gospel. Uh, for those who are retired, and of course, whatever age you are, if you have a neighbour or friend who you'd like to bring, you'll be very welcome to bring them and come along yourself and join with us. <clears throat> you'll be made very welcome. The only one thing we would say, we would like to know the numbers um, if you're able to come so that we can prepare tables and food um, <clears throat> ready for who's coming. Well, thank We'd you just so like much. to say thank you to you all for your prayers and for those who help in the lunch club. Thank yeah, you. love it. Thanks so much. Shall we pray for these two before they get down? Cool, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fellowship lunch. We love how... Alan and Barbara and the team have served faithfully for so long in this really, really important work. So, Father, we pray you would bless them as they carry on. Uh, bless those who serve and those who come. Help them to see that we have an amazing, good Saviour who is enough. Uh, so, Father, we pray that this would be the tune, the emphasis going forward with Fellowship Lunch, that they would be all about Jesus. And we're praying in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. Should we give a clap? clap? Thank you both. You can take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're going to sing again now. I'd love it if you would stand with me. And we will sing. So please stand, everyone. And let me pray. Father, we are grateful for the good news of the gospel. We thank you when Jesus said on the cross, It is finished that we can stand on those words and know freedom. That Jesus is enough. Jesus has done enough to make us righteous in your sight. And now we live in the freedom of your grace and mercy. Father, help us to celebrate that good news. Amen. Amen. We're just going to sing what may be a new song to a lot of us for the first song. Um, so I'm just going to sing the first verse and chorus twice as we get into it, but please, uh, especially if you know it, join in, even if you don't know it that well, that's fine, join in as soon as you can. But I'd just like us to focus on the, the great spiritual truth of the song. It says in Luke 14, Now great crowds were travelling with him, so he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Just bear that in mind as we sing together. <coughs> Christ is my reward and all of my devotion Now there's nothing in this world That could ever satisfy Through every trial My soul will sing No turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every 
To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. It is well So in my soul It is well It is well With my soul When peace like Sorrows like sea billows roll. 
Seal the promise, your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your very body. able to sing that Jesus is enough it is well with our soul and we have a living hope we pray that those truths don't just resound in this room but they are the tune of our lives father we thank you we thank you we can sing about you to you and over one another you're a good God and we're praying in Jesus name amen right please take your seats everybody we have come to the point in the service where the kids go out to their groups. There's a map on the screen. And everyone else left in the room, turn to the person next to you and ask them how their week was.
Hold it. All right, let's bring it in. Great, great, great to hear you chatting. And do remember after the service, you can stick around for a coffee and a donut and to catch up and continue all those conversations. Now we're going to dive into a time of prayer in just a couple of moments and our Bible reading. I'll hand over to Joe. But before we get there, I just want to talk about giving financially to the life of our church family. Now a massive part of our worship as Christians is that we give back to God what he has given to us. We give our time, we give our gifts, we give our energy, we give the space in our homes to love others. And another part of that is we give financially. And one of the key places that a Christian gives to is to the life of their local church. So we would encourage you, if you are a follower of Jesus, you call this the, your home church, and if you're able to, give financially to our church family. Now you can sign up through our website, or to make it even more simple, there are these postcards by each of the doors. You can grab one of those, and all of the information you could possibly need is on the back there, and you can find out more details. So go ahead with that. All right, we always carve out time in our service to pray, and we're going to do exactly that because one of our values as a church is that we are prayerfully dependent in all that we do. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to thank God for his character and how good he is. I'm going to provide some space for confession of where we have fallen short. We're going to pray for those in our church family who are burdened, and we're going to look beyond these four walls and pray for our world, and we'll finish off by praying for Joe. So I'd love it if you could come with me to our Heavenly Father, drawing near to the throne of grace. In the name of Jesus, let's pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful and humbled hearts, knowing that we are under your mighty hand. Your word reminds us in 1 Peter 1 that through your great mercy, you have given us new life to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a future that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is kept for us by your power. We praise you for that incredible gift and for bringing us into your family as your kids. Lord, we see in your word time and time again that you are a, a compassionate God, you're a patient God. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love. You are a God who is kind and has compassion and forgives our sins. We praise you that your mercy and grace is new every morning. But Father, we want to ask for your forgiveness. There have been times this week where we have not lived as your faithful kids. You have called us to be holy but we have harbored sinful thoughts. We have spoken hurtful words. We have not done what we should have done and stayed silent. Or we have done selfish things. Father, we confess that we stray from your goodness way too often. But we pray, Lord, by your grace, we would know we are cleansed from all unrighteousness because we stand in the righteousness of Jesus. As David prayed, create within us pure hearts, Lord, that we may follow more closely in the footsteps of our Saviour. And Lord, we pray for our church family too. We know that walking with Jesus doesn't mean that we will be free of burdens and trials in this life. There are plenty of people in our church family who are struggling today. We pray for those with health issues, those who are grieving lost loved ones, those who are battling addiction and the shame that comes with it, those who are suffering through difficult relationships, or those who are carrying secret sorrows and don't have the strength to speak. Father, we lift our church family, those who are weary and heavy laden, asking for your healing hand and comforting presence, Remind us of your words in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Father, we look beyond the bounds of this room this morning, and we see a world that is broken, 
It is messy. It is fallen. There is so much pain. There is so much confusion. There is so much heartache. Evil seems to prevail in far too many places. But we know that your light shines in darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. So we pray, Lord, you would empower your church all over the world to be salt and light in every community. Use us, Lord, to spread the hope of Christ wherever there is hopelessness. Bring renewal and redemption into every place that is broken. And now, Lord, we pray for Joe, who's going to be bringing your word to us. We pray you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. Give Joe confidence and clarity, passion as he preaches. May the scriptures come alive so that we understand what you have to say to us in a fresh way. Prepare our hearts and our minds to be well-cultivated soil to receive the, the seeds of truth. Help us, Lord, to live out what we learn so that our lives are increasingly conformed to the image of Jesus. Father, we commit this time to you. And may everything we do bring glory to your name. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks for praying along with me. Now we come to our Bible reading now, and we're going to be reading a couple of verses from 1 Peter chapter 5. Those words are going to be behind me on the screen, so you can read them there. Or if you've got your own Bibles with you, you can get that open. And it's about that far through the Bible, so almost towards the end. You can find out where it is. You've got your phones with you, you've got the Bibles on there. You can get those open too. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. I'll give you just a couple of moments. I see some searching. And then we're going to read just these two verses. And then Joe's coming up. It goes like this. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. It's God's word. Over to Joe. Thank you, James. Let me add my welcome to those already given. So good to see you all this morning. Now, as we come to this passage, I'm just going to pray once more. Father, help us to have hearts that are open to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Lord, help us to See what it is that you have to say. Lord, humble us, I pray, before you, and then build us up in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't underestimate your opponent. It's sort of mantra we might hear kind of spoken around in different contexts, maybe especially in a sporting context, whether it's a, a boxing match or a tennis match. Don't underestimate your opponent. Whenever I hear something like that, it makes me think of the, can we have the next slide, please? The FA Cup. This is a, uh, a football tournament that happens in England. It's quite famous. And instead of people normally playing in their, their leagues, like the big teams against the big teams, the small teams against the small teams, here it all gets mixed up. You can get drawn against any team. They could be the top of the league, the best team in the country. They could be right at the bottom. And it'd be easy, wouldn't it? You're the big team, you go in there, your opponent, they're like miles down in the league from you. You think, oh, this is going to be easy. That's exactly what I thought yesterday when the local team, Ipswich Town, were playing a team 98 places below them in the National League structure. I thought, oh, it's going to be a walk in the park. End of the result, Ipswich lost 2-1. It's been quite the story. See, it's so easy, wouldn't it, to go in thinking, oh, this is going to be easy to underestimate your opponent. It's not just in the world of football, is it? This is a chap called Michael Fish. Uh, he's, he was a weather forecaster back in the day. He's still famous to this day, even though this was in 1987, because one day he got up on national TV and said, you've heard that there's a storm coming tonight? Don't worry, it's going to be fine. It's, nothing's going to happen. The next morning, the country wakes up to the worst storm in almost 300 years. 15 million trees are flattened. Uh, a, um, a ferry gets blown from the English Channel and runs aground on the beach. It was awful. 
I mean, it's kind of funny that we still talk about Storm 45 years ago when in the States. I know you have stuff way worse all the time, but still, <laughs> underestimated what we were facing, Michael Fish going down in history. Someone else who underestimated the opponent to much more devastating consequences is this guy here in red. He's a chap called Neville Chamberlain. He was English Prime Minister in 1939, and he's just got off a plane here meeting with the German leader. And there'd been quite a lot of worry. Is there going to be a war? What's this guy doing, this German chap? How's it going to end? Neville just got back and says, it's fine. He's not got any big intentions at all. Peace for our time. Don't worry about him. He underestimated the enemy, because that leader was none other than Adolf Hitler, and we ended up embroiled in the worst human conflict that there has ever been. Or you think about it from the other side of the pond's perspective on the Second World War. What was it, that December morning, everyone got up there in Pearl Harbor thinking it was just another ordinary day, but an hour later, pretty much the whole fleet destroyed because the strength of the Japanese Air Force had been underestimated and the consequences were... Can we have another slide, please? Um, were this. Ships completely destroyed. America brought into the war. Don't underestimate your opponent. Because if you realize you've got a formidable enemy, you do something about it, right? You live life differently. It changes. You have a battlefield mentality. But the one thing worse than having a ferocious enemy is having an undetected ferocious enemy or an underestimated ferocious enemy. When they're there on the threshold, but you don't know it at all, that's a scary place to be. At least if you know about it, you can do something about it. This is why military spend billions of pounds every year on surveillance, on spies, on ships, on satellites, all these things to try and work out what the enemy are doing, where they are, who they are, how it's working. If you can find out what's going to happen, you can at least give a warning. And our passage in 1 Peter this morning really is that kind of warning. We're almost at the end. We've been going through this book over the last couple of terms. We're right near the end. It was written by Peter. He was one of Jesus' disciples. He was the one that always opened his mouth a bit too much and it got him into trouble time and time again. He was also the one who messed up big time because he overestimated himself and underestimated what he faced. The night before Jesus was killed, he said, oh, it's fine. I can stand with Jesus. I'm going to be the big, brave one. They can do whatever they want to me. I'm not leaving your side, Jesus. But just a matter of hours later, he had denied Jesus, that he even knew Jesus three times. Jesus restored him. He forgave him. And then Peter went on to be this really big church leader. And here he's writing to Christians scattered across the Roman Empire in the first century. And what's he saying? Well, across the whole book, he's saying, keep going. Remember the hope you've got, even though life is hard. But just before he closes the book, it's as though he's just about to hit that send button He's just about to run out of parchment. He needs to seal it up and send it on. He's got something he wants to say. It's a warning. Don't do what I did. Don't underestimate who you are facing. Because we too have a ferocious enemy. Ultimately, that's not some human dictator. That's not some terrorist organization. No, it's deeper than that. It's a deeper spiritual evil. It's the devil. And we're going to see Peter's warning. Keep your eyes open. Be alert. Don't miss it. Don't underestimate the enemy. He is ferocious. But then Peter's going to offer hope too. We're not alone. We're safe because Jesus is with us. But before we get into the text, I think we just need to pause and and think for a minute. Because when I talk about the devil, I wonder how you respond Maybe you've been in church 30, 40, 50 years, and and you've heard about this before, but maybe like me, you sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable when we talk about the devil. It just seems something a bit weird, hard for us to relate to. Maybe you're quite new to Christianity. Maybe you're like, do I sure even believe in the devil? Is that even a thing? What do I make of all of this? Maybe you're sat here and you're not a Christian, and you're thinking, really? You actually believe that stuff? I thought we got rid of that hundreds of years ago, this weird superstition of this man in red with horns and a pitchfork. Do you really believe that kind of stuff? Well, so before we get into text, I've just got five really quick points that I want to say why it's important that we do understand who the devil is 
and why it is credible and vital that we understand that. So really quickly, five points. Firstly, the devil is part of the package of Christianity. If we say we believe in God, we say we believe in the resurrection, we say we believe Jesus was God himself stepped down in human flesh on this earth, then part of that package is also that there is a devil. We might not like to believe it, but truth isn't on our terms. It's on God's terms. So we can't just pick and choose what we believe. We can't just brush the devil under the carpet and say, no, I don't believe that, but I believe this stuff. I mean, if there is a God who stepped down into this world, who then rose from the dead, it it wouldn't be such a bigger step to believe that there's also some evil power, spiritual power out there too. Of course, we need to get our understanding right about who the devil actually is. This caricature of someone with a pitchfork and horns, I think, is really unhelpful. That's not in the Bible at all. No, in the Bible, the devil's presented as someone who was once an angel, the chief angel. But then he rebelled against God and took with him some of those other angels who then were on his side, now opposing God and God's people. He's a spiritual being who is powerful. It's part of the package of Christianity. But secondly, without the evil one, we lose the right to call anything evil. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe you're sat here and you're thinking, frankly, I don't really believe in any of it. God, the virgin birth, resurrection, the devil, none of it, thank you very much. I just believe this world is all there is. But if that is you, have you really thought about the implications of that belief? Because we all have these belief systems, that, things that we believe, that we then kind of build our lives and societies on. So if you take away the foundation of God and, and a deeper spiritual realm, what do you have to base your belief system on? Because there are things for all of us that we hold to and we know to be true. Things that we bang, stakes we bang into the ground and say, we know this is right. Things like the Holocaust was evil. We know it to be true that justice matters, that society should be fair for everyone. These are all things that we say, yes, that's true. So whatever belief system we have underneath it, it needs to be able to hold those things up. It's like if you're building a bridge. You need to make sure you've got your foundation right so then it can support what it needs to do, however many cars it needs to support, or this weight it needs to exist for this long. You need to get your foundation right. And ultimately, I think we have two choices. We either have a foundation of God, and let's for argument say the God of the Bible, and we see very quickly we can build a structure that does hold to those things because God is good and perfect and just, and yes, there is a force of evil too, but then we can say very quickly, yeah, the stuff like the Holocaust is wrong because God is good and God is fair. But if you take that away, can you really call anything evil? If all your foundation is a big bang that started everything off, like knocking down the first dominoes, and then everything else was just then all those dominoes falling down (laughs) as you go on in life, if we just happen to come about by chance through the kind of craziness of how the chemistry all fit together to make us be alive, if then our consciousness is just a figment of our imagination, if therefore the laws that we say, the moral code that we have are just our own invention... Can we really say that something like the Holocaust really is evil? If someone challenged that, would you have a robust argument against it if you don't have any deeper spiritual good and evil? It's an important thing. Because if you don't, that's a very scary place to be. People might try and argue it from some sort of self-preservation. Oh, yeah, we need to be nice to each other to, in order to help the human race to stand together and be strong. But even if you take that argument, it's a very small step to then start to look at the group of people you're going to bond around and, and look at a few people and think, hmm, I think actually we'd be stronger if you weren't in the group. And, oh, you over there, no thanks, we don't want you either. We'll be stronger if it's just this, this special people. And then you suddenly find yourself in the Holocaust again because that's exactly what Hitler tried to do. So you need to have a solution. Can you really look at it and say it's evil if you get rid of God? But thirdly, the existence, of evil explain, the existence of the evil one explains the existence of evil in the world. If we look at the world, we see it is dark. We see it's scary. We look at humans and what we do. And man, there's so much evil there. Where does that come from? 
Suddenly, if you do introduce a deeper spiritual force that can influence things in this world, it makes sense of what we see in the world around us. Fourthly, if we look at other cultures, we suddenly see how weird it is that in our culture we do get rid of the spiritual realm and good and evil, because pretty much every other culture that's ever existed did hold to spiritual good and evil. Yeah, they might have been different, but we're a very weird culture to kind of get rid of anything other than the physical. We have to hold that in, in mind too. And fifthly, I think we see something of the devil's undercover scheme. Because if there was a devil, what a masterstroke it would be if he could influence us to come to a place where we don't even believe he exists. I mean, we talked about the power of a hidden threat. What a masterstroke it would be of the devil if he could persuade us he doesn't even exist if he is there. C.S. Lewis takes up this point in his genius work, The Screwtape Letters. Here, building on a biblical foundation of good and evil and evil spirits out there, He kind of imagines the sort of conversation that these evil creatures might have to each other in order to try and get at humans to pull them away from God. And he imagines the conversation from some older kind of uncle figure to a younger figure, trying to advise him on the best way to tempt humans, um, or kind of patience, as it's called in the book. Um, And here's one of the letters that what C.S. Lewis says. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. Of course, this has not always been so. We're faced with a cruel dilemma. When the humans disbelieve in our existence, we lose all the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics. I do not think you'll have much difficulty in keeping the patient as humans in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you if any faint suspicion of your existence comes to arise in his mind. Suggest to him a pitch of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that... It's an old textbook method of confusing them. He therefore cannot believe in you. Now, there's a lot more that could be said, but I hope we're kind of on the same page that it's not utterly crazy to believe in the devil. And actually, if we look at the Bible, we see the Bible does affirm it. So if the devil does exist, it's super important we understand the threat he poses. Just like spy planes and satellites and decoders We need to get our thinking right. We need to understand who the enemy is. And I think we often fall into one of two camps on this. We either underestimate the the threat of the devil. We kind of go through life imagining he's not really there. Maybe as Christians, we get so used to the ways we just keep slipping up into sin. We get so used to seeing people around us who said that they were Christians suddenly going away from the faith. And we forget that maybe there's a deeper, darker, evil force at work there. On the other side, some people overestimate the danger, especially in other cultures across the world. People live in fear of the demon of the village or the curse that an ancestor put on their family. Maybe we're less likely to fall into that trap. But as we come to this passage, we're going to see Peter provide us something for both sides. See, we should be alert because we do have a ferocious foe. We mustn't miss it. We mustn't underestimate him. But also we can take heart. We can stand firm because we are not alone. So let's dig into this text and see what God has to say to us in it. Firstly, be alert. We have a ferocious foe. Next slide, please, Paul. Let me read verse 8 again. Be sober mindful. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Peter uses this strong image describing the devil like a prowling lion, like a roaring lion. It's an impressive sight, isn't it? There, a lion that stood on a rock, letting out this massive roar, saying to the whole of the pride land, or wherever it is, Look at me. I'm in charge. I'm strong. Don't mess with me. You see it when you go to the zoo, don't you? You look at those legs, the muscles in the back. You look at the jaw, the huge teeth, the massive mane. Lions are impressive. Lions are strong. I mean, they're called the king of the jungle for a reason, aren't they? What's Peter saying? The devil, he's strong. He's formidable. He loves to stand up there and put other people in fear. He loves to say, don't mess with me. I'm in charge here. The devil's strong. Don't underestimate him. 
But we also see something about the devil's character. Because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. How does a lion look on an antelope or gazelle? Well, in its eyes, it wants it, doesn't it? It wants to kill. It looks at it and says, you're mine. I'm going to get you. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to devour you. There's hostility there. And so there is, when the devil looks at us, this is our foe. He wants to eat us alive. He wants to cut us off from Jesus, to take away our hope. He wants to wrap you up in guilt and leave you there, shamed, mocked, bare, exposed, as he brings his friends over to mock us as we lie there in the ground. He wants nothing more than to pull us down into utter darkness with him for eternity. Don't domesticate him. He wants to devour. But thirdly, he's sneaky, and we mustn't miss him. We see uh, Peter describe him uh, prowling round like a roaring lion. It kind of gives this image of a, a threat that, that's always on the move. It's like someone circling around trying to find that little chink in the armor. In other places, the devil's described less like a lion and more like a snake. There's kind of this image of, of something that's very sneaky, crafty, can kind of get in undetected. I mean, think about how a lion goes about catching its prey. You can imagine there those little antelope standing there in the grass. It's a beautiful evening. They're just munching away. The sun's just about to set. It's a beautiful scene. It's a peaceful scene. And maybe one of those antelope kind of hears something in the grass over there and um, thinks, what's that? And maybe they trot over to the little herd leader and say, do you think we should move away from that grass? Because I heard something in there. And maybe that herd leader's like, oh, don't worry about it. Stop being so paranoid. Just get on eating your grass. Don't worry at all. When all the time there in the grass is the lion, watching, waiting, poised, barely breathing, eyes fixed, muscles ready, waiting for his chance. And then when the antelope least expect it, bang, he's gone. The flock scatter, and the lion eyes up that one that he wants, and he goes and he gets it. That's how lions work, don't, isn't it? They're stealthy, they're clever, they're sneaky. They're easily missed. And so it is with the devil. We must never miss him. We ne must never mistake his voice for our own. That voice inside that says, go on, give in. I know you want to. It would give you so much pleasure, wouldn't it? Or maybe that voice that calls us to look on that man or that woman and say, oh, wouldn't life be so much better if I was with them than with the person I'm married to? That's not an epiphany. That's the devil trying to bring you down. Or maybe it's that voice and says that, that inside that says, I can't believe you let them do that to you. I can't believe you let them walk on you. Go on, get them back. That's the devil trying to break apart church unity. Or maybe it's that little whisper inside that says, you know that thing you did back then? I can't believe you did that. God will never love you again. Look at what you did. Look how guilty you are. God doesn't really care about you. Or maybe it's that whisper that says, I thought God was meant to be kind. But look how he's treated you. Let, look at what he let you go through time and time again in your life. If he was really that good, surely he'd treat you better than this. All schemes of the devil to try and get at us in a sneaky way. He's clever. He wants to do it and leave. And we didn't even know it was him as he tries to pull us down to take our eyes off Jesus. See, here's Peter's warning. We might not like to believe it. We might not like to think about the devil. But it's true. We're in a state of war. We're fighting a battle. Peace does not yet rule in our days. It will one day. Yes, victory is assured. That final day is coming, but it's not here yet. So let's not underestimate the foe. That's at an individual level. As Paul says to the Corinthians, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. It's also true of a church level, because I think it's been amazing over the last few months and years seeing the way that God has blessed this church how he has caused people who didn't know Jesus to come and know him. How we've seen so many people be built up in their faith and their trust. 
And that's amazing. And we want that to continue, don't, you? don't we? We want to look out beyond the four walls here, to, beyond the immediate vicinity, to go out and win people for the gospel across West Suffolk. We want other people to know the hope. We want to bring other people in. Wherever we are, we want to be people who are lights, bringing out the good news of Jesus. And the devil's going to hate that. The devil's going to be trying to get at, uh, get at us because he doesn't want that to happen. He does not want us to win. He does not want people to come to Jesus. So let's be alert. Let's be watchful. Let's be sober-minded. Let's not let him get in, get a foothold, try and pull us apart from the inside. No. Let's pay attention. We have a formidable enemy. Let's not rest on our laurels. Firstly, be alert, we have a ferocious foe. But secondly, stand firm, you're not alone. Because maybe you hear this and you think, oh, I just feel like that little antelope and here's the lion coming out to get me. What chance do I stand? I mean, at least an antelope can run. But look at me, I can't even run properly and I'm exhausted. How do I stand any chance at all? Well, keep listening because there's hope. Because we're not on our own. Let's look at verse 9 again. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We're not on our own, and that's for two reasons. Firstly, because Christ is with us. Peter tells us to to stand firm in our faith. That's not faith in kind of the kind of vague sense. That's not faith in ourselves. No, it's talking about faith in Jesus. And Jesus is bigger. And Jesus has overcome. Jesus is bigger. It might look like the bout could go either way. Sometimes it might feel like Christ isn't winning. Sometimes he might appear small and weak and vulnerable. But there isn't even a contest. Jesus is unmatched. Jesus is invincible. Jesus is almighty. Jesus is the king of the jungle and the world and the whole cosmos and over everything. The devil flees at his presence. Yeah, the devil's strong and mighty and formidable. He might be like a roaring lion, but Jesus is the lion, the lion of Judah. I'm reminded of a clip from The Lion King, where little cub Simba's taken his friend Nala, and they've gone where they shouldn't have done, to the elephant graveyard, and there they end up surrounded by these hyenas, and they're scared. They feel like they've Enemies closing in, they stand no chance. But what happens then? Well, take a look. It might feel like the foe is formidable because we're just like that little cub surrounded by hyenas who seem to be closing in. But Jesus is so much stronger. Just like that lion is so much greater than those hyenas. You can just toss them aside like that. That is Jesus. He is bigger. Yes, our little roar might feel very pathetic. But when Jesus roars, things change. But secondly, Jesus, uh, Christ is with us. Jesus is bigger, but, but Jesus has also overcome because there's already been a battle. There's already been a battle. D-Day, that happened 2,000 years ago. And on that day, it did look like the enemy had won. It looked like Jesus had been crushed. For a while, the disciples despaired. But of course, we know what happened next. When Sunday morning came around, when the third day came, Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't defeat at all. No, it was victory. See, the only threat the devil really had was to accuse, to try and pull people down and show them their guilt and say, you've got no hope because God is just and he's going to have to judge you for your sin. 
But on the cross, Jesus did away with that guilt. Jesus got rid of it. He took it on himself. As Paul says in Colossians 2, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The devil loves to try and get us and say, look how much in debt you are. But Jesus has taken that away. So then Paul goes on to say, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the ruler and authorities, that's talking about the devil and his guys, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. As we just sang a few minutes ago, though Satan does buffet, though trials do come, let this glad assurance be mine that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Yeah, the devil might roar, but he will never get us if we're one of Jesus' people. Because Jesus has won, because Jesus has crushed Satan under his feet. We're in Christ. We're in him. What's true of him is true of us because we're united to him. So we're not alone. So stand firm in Christ. Then we will be safe. But secondly, we're not alone because our family is with us. Let's look at verse 9, that second half again. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. It can feel so isolating, can't it, when the Christian life is tough, when it's hard. When we're constantly being reminded of our sin. Those voices saying we're never going to be good enough. It's a very solitary path when we're battling with sin and it seems like we keep falling again and again and again. And then the shame comes with that, saying, you can't tell anyone about this because what will they think of you then? They won't want anything to do with you. They're better than you. You can't do it. Look at how guilty you are. God doesn't really love you. See, the devil loves to try and pull us away to isolate us, just like that lion. As he looks at that herd of antelope, he wants to pull one away and get at one, because he can take one. But if it's the whole herd, he doesn't stand a chance. That's what the devil wants to do to us, looking for someone to devour. But we're not alone. Look at what Peter says. The same kinds of suffering are being experienced by Christians all over the world. However isolating the devil might make you feel, Know that your Christian brother in your community group or your Christian sister who you serve with at Sunday school or Christians in Nigeria or Australia or Bolivia or Canada or China or wherever it is, they're in this too. On the left-hand side and the right-hand side, they're in the trench with bullets whisking through your hair and shells going off all around you. They're in it too with you. They know what guilt is too. They know what shame is too. They've had doubts too. They've probably still got them right now. We're in this together. You're not alone. And isn't this the importance and the beauty of Christian community? Communities that are open, full of grace and love and vulnerability, where we can talk about this stuff, where we can pray together, when we can be there standing next to each other, arms round each other, supporting each other. See, we're not alone, but it often feels like we are. Often because we want to come with faces that make it look like we've got it all completely sorted. I think that's often a defense mechanism, isn't it? If we look like we've got it sorted, then maybe we'll feel like we've got it sorted. But in the face of the cross, we don't have to look like we've got it sorted because it's not on us. It's okay because we're in Jesus He robes us in his righteousness, in his goodness, in his life. So we're free to take our eyes off ourselves and onto Jesus and then onto other people too. We can stand there with them. We can open up to them. We can pray for each other. We can be there with each other because we're not alone. And so we stand firm. I'm told that if you're ever facing a a scary animal running straight at you, the best thing to do is to stand still. Don't run at it, because that will antagonize it. But don't run away, because it will like chasing you down. I learned this the hard way a few months ago, when I was in a a cow field trying to rescue a frisbee, looked up, and the whole herd were running straight at me, and I absolutely legged it in the opposite direction. 
and I ended up pretty bad and got my foot caught on barbed wire, and it didn't go well. Don't do it. They say to stand firm, stand still. Yeah, you look at them, and you see this big thing coming at you. We do that with the devil. Yeah, he's formidable. But we can stand firm, not in ourselves, but in Jesus. Because in Jesus, he has done everything. He has won the victory. He's with us, and he has that mighty roar, and they flee before him. So let's not run at Satan with our swords drawn, thinking we can do it on our own, because we never can. But let's not leg it in panic. We're safe in Jesus. So let's be a people who are alert, who have a battlefield mentality, who know that we're in a fight against a real enemy who wants to pull us down. Let's keep our eyes open to that. Let's remind ourselves of that every day. But let's then look to Jesus, the mighty lion. Let's keep our eyes on him. Let's make it our daily prayer to deliver us from evil. See, if we look away from him, that's when we're vulnerable. If we get pulled away, that's when we're on our own and in trouble. But let's stay close to Jesus. The devil might try and get us. He might try and frighten us. He might even wound us. But if we're in Jesus, he will never get us. We are safe. So let's be a people that keep our eyes on him, the mighty lion, that look to him, that trust him, and go in his strength. Shall I pray as we finish. Lord, these are truths that are hard for us to understand in a world that seems to mock the very existence of you and also the existence of evil. But Lord, thank you that even though there is a real enemy that we face, that you are mighty, you are greater, and you have won the victory Yes, we are fighting a battle, but it is a battle you have already won to help us to stand firm, rooted in you. Help us to know you more. Oh Lord, fill us with your spirit that we might see you more and therefore know that we have a hope that no one can take away in you. So give us strength, we pray, for each day. Help us to keep our eyes on you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing a final song, which is all about the battle we face, but it's a battle that Jesus has won. So why don't you stand with me as we sing? i
dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he led set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus, thank you that you have won the victory. Lord, you have defeated death and the evil one and everything else, and you reign. Yes, Lord, we still face a foe. Help us to be watchful, but help us to know that you are with us and therefore to stand firm. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Do stick around. There's tea and coffee and donuts served at the back. Um, Connect with each other and hope to see you soon. God bless. Go in peace.